Kokina semnol kake mo faseda. Welcome to Talking in Stations, a podcast about EVE Online. I am Matt Arrow, here with Artemis. Howdy, howdy. Baleful. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever. Elise Randolph. Hey, how's it going? Happy to be here. Tiberius. Uh, good morning, everyone. Caleb. Hey, guys. And our one guest, Killer B. Yo. Hey. Uh, how are you guys all doing today? Anything interesting happened this week with you? Oh, not really. How about the rest of you guys? I think I've lost more Corvettes and killed more Corvettes in the last two days than I have in my entire year of life. Are you doing that uh, ancillary shield wrapper uh, build with the Velator? Yeah, well, the ancillary armor wrap, but yeah. I've, I've, I've heard of people talking about, like, everybody's, like, ancillary shield rep repping with the Velator, and I'm like, that's not, I expected the Velator, but that's not what I expected. I expected, like, Ram Blaster Velator, but it kind of makes sense. You still have the two drones, and you have Velator Lodgy. I mean, that's not a phrase I ever thought I'd say. Uh, Looking at the losses, like most of these things are un completely unfit. The losses from the tournament. I think people are just doing their um, daily uh, enter uh, enter the proving grounds to get five thousand SP or whatever. I suppose we should we should back up and explain what in the world we're talking about, shouldn't we? Well, we're still on we're still on introduction, so I just want to hear from Caleb like what he's been up to this week because he's had some hand hand combat on this the daily shows. Okay, so he's uncharacteristically quiet. <laughs> uh, I guess he's not going to speak up on this. Caleb, are you still there? I should be. Uh, it's just uh, for some reason my window activation was being dumb. Um, no, my week has been uh, in the name of Asher and all the drama that his uh, nighttime aphorisms were causing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I guess we'll talk about that a little bit. It's not, it's not our usual thing on the Sunday show, but if we... If we want to, we can. All right. Uh, first thing, we should probably talk about the uh, tournament since that's what kind of came up. Artemis, you were about to say something. I cut you off. Go ahead. I was just going to say, so the Raglavian Proving Grounds have changed tournament styles, what have you, and so now it's a 5v5 rookie ships. On the Less Than 10 podcast, I think it was Rise who came on and said that this is very much their trial to see if they can do larger team-based events. They want to see, like, if it's the cheapest possible ship, are they able to support small queue times with 5v5? And I don't know, I've not actually participated, but how are the queue times for those of you? Elise, sounds like you've been doing a lot. Uh, so I think there's, there's a bit of a reason why you see a lot of unfit ships uh, in, the, in the Abyss. It's because people, to force a queue, I believe, and I'm probably wrong here because I'm not, like, a uh, hardcore of this. I could just kind of do it for fun. Um, but I believe you need eight teams of five Corvettes in order to get the queue going. Otherwise, you'll just be stuck in a forever queue. So if there's only two teams that want to participate, then you're kind of bummed. You'll be stuck there forever. So what people have been doing to force the queue to go is they've just been seeding it with alts, which uh, we saw this happen in the That's so 3v3 funny. slicers as well. People just shove three unfit slicers in there just to push a match. Um, so a lot of times you'll have, at least in US time zone, you'll have at least uh, four or five teams actually competing. And then of those four or five teams, uh, three of them are going to have to pony up with five other alts to just start the whole matchmaking process. So like, so like you need eight teams to force a queue? Yeah. So like you need like there are people probably pulling out 40 alts to field all eight teams. I, I believe... I believe if you look at the top of the leaderboards, I'm sure some of those people are doing that. But that that is peak Eve. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This, this whole thing is very much peak Eve. It brings out the the absolute Eve in people, uh, and they've been trying to iterate it, iterate on it, right? So in the in the first one, 
I need a pony box Corvette to be right back, guys. Cable went in with a very expensive fit, um, and he he won. Like he got a hundred kills real fast. Um, Isn't this one locked to like not even T two? It's locked to better four. Yeah, so they've been tweaking how, what you can bring in. So no pirate implants. Uh, this one they've even taken it one step further. So no tech two fits. No faction stuff. It's all tech one and named and met like meta five and lower. Uh, the, the drones have to be tech one. Or... Yep, the drones yeah. have to be tech one and everything. So, is there something to uh, people using alts in order to get the queues to actually work, and the idea that people are colluding with their friends to rig the matches? Yeah, very much both of those things are, are true. In the in the battle. Cruiser meta and the battle cruiser one because you only needed two people to enter, I think, or it was very small. Um, it was super popular, and they didn't you didn't need to like stuff the queue, you didn't need to, to so, stuff like, the box. The thing about that is though, and I have like an alternate hypothesis where, like, sure, Corvettes are the literal cheapest chip, but they're also boring as shit to fly. Like, battle cruisers are one of the most fun ships to fly in my opinion of course that one would be super popular even if they're like 100 million a pop as opposed to basically free for yeah. some of the newer people why are why are the uh, battle cruisers some of the funnest ships to fly well i mean oh so can go for it. so in my opinion a battle cruiser is something that's maybe agile enough to move around and kind of roam around by your by yourself or in a small gang but it's also got like you can also like feel like the power upgrade versus a cruiser you often have a lot more buttons to play around with versus like a lot of cruiser and frigate fits so when you move up to a battle you, when you move from like a cruiser to a battle cruiser especially when you're a newer player it like to me when i got like when i moved from like an omen to a harbinger i felt like the world just open up and like to this day harbinger is my favorite ship in the game right um, it just like to me, it feels like a battle cruiser is. It's not too slow to like have to move around fast and to run away from stuff with, and it's not too expensive to just throw into a fire and well for fun. And it's got a lot of buttons and it's got a decent amount of power. That's mm. that's my view on battle cruiser. So it's got the sweet spot and all those things. Yeah, I, that's what I think. Yeah, when when people are just entering PvP, the the old Eve mantra used to be, oh, just buy a hundred rifters, go out there, and by the time your rifters are dead, you'll be good at PvP. And I always cringed when people said that because <laughs> frigate PvP is literally the hardest, right? You've got no wiggle room. You have to make all those like so, split second decisions real fast. As somebody who started in frigates, I will say that yeah, like frigate PvP on like especially a smaller smaller gang level is something that requires you to move a lot faster and and twitch and it feels really like cool when you're like dog fighting with frigates and i still have to get the last 100 kills i need to move from two to one with the crucifier navy but that's that's beside the point on zeke <laughs> but uh frigates the thing about going out with those 20 rifters or those 20 punishers or whatever is that a lot of players start pvping and they're like scared to lose a ship and it's a lot easier to lose a rifter or a punisher than than like a battle cruiser when you're new. Yeah, I always push people to fly something like a Drake or a Myrmidon or a Brutix yeah. or something like that because Less. if you if like stuff happens, you can just push the buttons. Like yeah. it's okay if you've got a brain lag of three or four seconds between. At, at the same should time, I do this? a lot of people would just be more willing to go out if you're like if you hand them like a Punisher and then they lose it and it's not that bad and then they lose another one and that's not that bad and they're like oh maybe i can take out my cruiser next and they lose that and it's not that bad right like people have like this doomsday scenario in their head like when they're when they're new like oh no if i lose my ship it's terrible and then it's like yeah you lose your ship and like it's not terrible right and you have to get that feeling out of the way a few times i think that is probably that probably does play into it as well but yeah so the battle cruiser event really popular um, it didn't need anyone to like uh, to force the queues to go. The five v fives, just by their nature, right? Uh, you need four other friends. So in the battle cruiser one, you just needed to know one person. Um, the five v fives, you need to know four other people, which and, and convince them that they have to fly corvettes for for ten minutes. Um, so it's been those things where like they seem they sound fun in like theory, but then they're boring in practice. I think. Yeah, so, like, oh, so the event so far has been, like, very limited in scope. 
uh, with people definitely just stuffing it to, to force uh, the queue times. So I think, I mean, if they if they want to do this, I think they probably have to tweak a little bit um, just the way the queue works. And I don't even know if it's actually eight. That's just what someone uh, who is like super into it told me uh, that it is eight teams. They, I guess they did the math. Right, they did the math. But um, but just from my like random uh, random doing of it, that's that does seem to be the the actual spot. They uh, why did CCP go to Corvette? It's the rookie ship, basically. Why would it go to something so small? Well, they said that um, they're they're testing out to see if they can support queues of larger teams and have the queue go fast. So they wanted to do it the cheapest thing possible to do that test. In terms of like organized group PvP, there is a, kind of a very neat thing that's been happening. Um, so as we all know, the Alliance tournament has been put on a hiatus. Uh, we learned that, was it the beginning of this year or the beginning of last year? One of the, 2020 has been so weird, I don't even know it when, when it happened. Um, but they did announce that uh, the EU's official Alliance tournament was put on hiatus. Um, it has been two years since there has been some sort of competitive EV, PvP uh, organized on that large of a scale. Uh, there have been some like player groups that have come forward and done some very neat things. Ronix has done the 5v5 scrims, uh, which has been a lot of fun to watch. Uh, those are now over. Um, but last month, we learned that uh, EVNT, the people who put on, uh, did the production, the player group that did the production for the Alliance tournament the last four years or so, um, got authorization from CCP and the resources they need to... Um, put on the EVNT Alliance Open, which is uh, basically the Alliance tournament with a different name and slightly different prize structures, but run entirely by the players. Um, in the beginning of the month, we had Ithaca Hawk and Bay Arche, um, who were doing a lot of the organization for it from the EVNT side. They made the announcement like, okay, we're opening it up to 32 teams and we'll have a playoff if we go above uh, 32 teams. And we opened up the sign up and actually on the show, uh, people were listening to it live and they were like, oh, this is cool. So they signed up. So they got like five or six people to sign up just right on the show. So that was pretty cool. And that was the beginning of the month. The signups, yeah, on our show. Uh, yeah, so the yeah. signups for that end, I believe um, Monday or Tuesday. Uh, so very soon here. So if you want to get down, you can do it. But I believe the last number I saw was that 44 teams have registered. Wow. Uh, which blows out the, the 32 that they were hoping to get. And I know there are like, there are some contingency factors because people aren't, aren't sure how popular this is going to be. Uh, CCP is obviously not sure how popular it's going to be because they kind of put the whole thing on hiatus. But we ended up getting uh, 40 something teams to register, which is amazing. Uh, and the live draw for that will be on Tuesday on the EVNT Twitch channel and on the EVNT YouTube. So if you want to see if your team got in uh, into the main bracket, check out there. If you're going to go in through the elimination bracket, check out there. Uh, or I guess the feeder bracket. And if you still want to register, there is still time. You have until, I think, Monday at midnight Eve time. So uh, that is something I'm like really okay. excited to see how that plays out. How much do we think, Gunsp? Uh, gonna not win the uh, <laughs> i think so in the interesting thing and i'm not 100 percent sure because I, i've been super busy the last couple of weeks so i haven't been able to get involved with event as much as i'd like to do um but i think goon actually do have an official team in there i think tests also have a team in there um pl horde and nc dot those three have yet to put up a team uh so these like historical well i guess horde's not a historical tournament team but goblin's is a historical tournament captain. So those guys haven't yet put in a team yet. I don't know if it's because they don't want to devote the resources during a war, um, because these things kind of do take a lot of time from some very important people, uh, or, or what. So that inside joke, Artemis, is, is why. Why wouldn't goons sign up in time? I think Elise is going to be the one to tell the story. OK. So uh, the goons have had a rough relationship with the Alliance tournament before. They, they... <laughs> They, every once in a while, they try. And so basically what the process was to register in, in the past was you had to, there was a Plex entry fee. And you had to contract that Plex entry fee to CCP. Uh, and then they would accept it. And then you'd be put in the list. So the Matani ended up putting it to 
not CCP, but CCP Engineering Alliance, which is a completely different alliance, uh, and it's not CCP at all. So <laughs> they put their entry fee just to the wrong spot, and they were shocked when they did the, the live draw and goons weren't picked. They are like, man, why, why aren't goons here? We're, we're getting screwed. And CCP were like, you didn't enter at all, so how could we enjoy your name? So they looked back and saw it was the CCP Engineering Alliance instead of CCP. And ever since then, they've had a, a bumpy road with the Alliance. Yeah, it's not, it's not just one thing, but it, was, uh, it seems like Some like four random times. player group got a giant Plex donation. <laughs> Wait, that, that, that corporation or alliance uh, didn't belong to CCP? Uh, I don't know. I actually have no idea. That would be a heck of a scam. I mean, you had said it was uh, not with CCP, but I guess it's just not the CCP alliance, right? Yeah, it's not the official CCP alliance. So it could have been yeah. just like another CCP. Yeah, I think CCP would like smash yeah. everybody who impersonates them, but that would be a I, great story. I think it's like the, the Bug Hunters Corp. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, they got a big All cash right. prize. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So that's... Um, that's the tournament that's different than what's going on with the uh, proving grounds. So those are two different things that we talked about. Uh, proving grounds are in game. You can participate right away. Uh, I believe the battle cruiser um, competition finished. And now the, um, what are they called again? I keep wanting to call them rookie ships. They're Corvettes. 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 That's Corvettes. their official word. Has anybody else done the storm, done any storm chasing? We did it on day one and uh, we stopped after we identified them but, but uh, storm chasing let's well, have you done it is that what you're yeah yeah um i i've seen each of the four storms um between a couple of streams um and a couple of this a couple of the storms that we didn't get to, like test anything out but like we saw like some of the drone sites spawned up in the storm in tribute and like we we did some of the extra triglavian sites that were in one of the storms in Providence, and that that was the storm with the the plus the plus damage um, minus application on the on the storm effects, and we like tackled the praxis, and like I got like deleted, my confessor got deleted with like a, a like point range from the praxis blasters because it was like triple tracking computer. And it just, it just, it two shot the confessor just because I had that extra damage. I was, it was like, it was actually kind of hilarious how fast it dropped. Um, but the, the Triglavian sites that spawn in the, the storm that spawns the Triglavian sites seemed to be basically just the emerging conduits that spawn in the normal Trigl Triglavian invasions with the same reward. The same reward as the ones in Lysac, not the same reward as the ones in Isaac, it seemed. Yeah, I know I, I ran that, into yeah. the the Providence one that has the extra data and relic sites it overlaps into the neighboring high sec system. Yeah, and I was that's moving the one, my like, tall and yeah. I was moving my um, not the blockade runner, the other one, the one that can't cloak but has the massive deep space transport. Yeah, I was moving my deep space transport through and trying to do the MWD cloak trick. It wouldn't work, and I was like, "What am I doing <laughs> wrong?" And then I realized, oh, there is this. Yeah. Space weather. electrical. Well, the yeah, first a... time I saw one, if I jumped into that one that's like all green, and I'm like, "Oh, it's an incursion," and then I'm like, "It's not an incursion." <laughs> right. They actually share the same color: the tropical storm and incursion. I actually uh, took some really nice pictures of some of the storms. That's really pretty. Cool. Hand them over to uh, Artemis there. Um, the electrical also storm went through and did like a, a news presenter, like "Here is the weather of New Eden" thing. It was rather amusing. Oh, Dunk Dinkle? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was annoyed that he didn't go with uh, the weatherman name, though. Like, we asked last week, or maybe it was the week before, we asked for a weatherman segment. But it's really important that you get the weatherman name. So it could be, like, Gamma Gary. Like, that could be his, his weatherman persona instead of Dunk Dinkle. I feel like Dunk Dinkle is already a pretty good name, though. But be... You've got to have... The weatherman name has to have some sort of meteorological effect in his name, right? I put some like, pictures in Discord. Uh, like Hail Harry or Tsunami uh, Tom. I, I don't. I don't know. But you need something with like a Hail Harry. Yeah. Sounds more like a like a flasher pilot then. 
He's got a he's got a slew of suits to go with this too. By the way, he has one with moons and uh, stars. This is uh, his with stars. Uh, so he's got he's got a variety to go through. Uh, oh, cool. So storm chasing. Um, I did watch you doing that. What, what are the characteristics of storm chasing? Um, do you be, are you specific to certain storms or are you just running around to different storms? Well, we were just running around to see them all for the first mm. time, but like we were thinking about like how to take advantage of like some of them where like you'd want to like run over to the area with like one storm with like a, a fit that's like meant to take advantage of it. Like you go to the one with the plus armor percentage and you just have like thick armory boys or something or yeah. you have uh something like that for access that well does <laughs> it, it, killed, it killed two of us right it just because mm. it, it had the ability to track even with the minus application and just because the plus damage was, was pretty good so that must have been surprising the storm worked against you right i mean yeah but it was, it was actually kind of funny. I yeah. thought it was funny. Well, I, we figured that the storm chasing, like as a career, would be you would you would dress up for certain storms to take advantage of what was there or activities. Yeah, but, yeah, but right now it's too early, so people are exploring them and playing with them. But uh, eventually, we we should see some people who specialize in working in electrical storms, for instance, without being cloaked, but being you able to. Oh my. Uh grab uh the one that spawns triglavian sites for mm -hmm. like the the salvage that it drops when the uh the invasion event goes away yeah where does that like what is that salvage used for what so some of it is used for like triglavian ships and some of it is used for the eden com ships i think if eden com ships they exist and are like never used right am i missing some niche use of them or are they still just um, somebody thing. was at, well, so in the, in the, the invasions recently, there's been like more ganking and somebody had like the idea of using the Eden comma ships to stop the ganking just because they AOE and the, and like gang catalysts don't have a lot of, a lot of health. So, but beyond niche uses, I don't think they just don't apply very well at the moment. Like hypothetically they could be like awesome in a perfect scenario but they like bounce the drones they bounce the friendlies they don't apply well under most circumstances so it, it's going to be niche for a while until those issues get fixed i think and so yeah. in isec it's really easy to suspect bait them because they'll bounce to the suspect right and then you can just kill them right oh, they shot me it's uh they, they entered they brought them in a little bit pre-nerfed and they haven't quite boosted them yet. There's also a lot of skills required to, to fly them. Yeah. So far, the only people I've seen using them are people just trying to get high on Z-Kill and just pad their own stats, right? Because you can just shoot one guy, and he'll shoot four others. So in a big fleet fight, if you can just hide in there uh, and not get shot in one of those cruisers. I know somebody that ships. multi boxes a lot of them and is trying really hard to make them work. And I'm rooting for him to like actually just break out with like a perfect use of them but um right now they they seem kind of like memes to me i think they tried too hard to make them like the exact opposite of the triglavian ships right like the triglavian ships are really good single target damage as long as you don't switch targets and they have a lot of utility and they're armor tanked so we have shield tanked no utility uh bad single target damage but spreads out the damage uh, triglavian ships are good, so Eden Com ships have to be bad, right? Because they're yeah, I mean, they did go for the thematic opposite on all accounts for sure. <laughs> yeah. Before uh, we stray too far from the topic, it looks like yeah. uscoutrescue.com/home has a live uh, weather tracker. So if you're ever wondering where the storms are centered, at the uh, uscoutrescue.com, that'll sort. If they're you on out. the uh, in-game map too, they'll show you where they are. Right. Cool. Thanks for that. Uh, Katya Seo was uh, letting us know uh, that person, if you do not know, is the only person to s circumvent the entire map, including wormhole space, which, and without losing a ship, which makes it even more incredible. So there's a giant, giant statue in her honor. I forget this home system. What system is that? Sasio. That's it. Sasio. It was an S. 
I wanted to say secede because that keeps popping up into my head. That's a low sex system instead. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's talk about, uh, there's some stuff that went and that happened with, we're going to get to the war in, in a bit. We'll bring Killer B back in, but there's a little bit more on Triglavian stuff's going on. Wasn't there a state of the, um, I don't know, fireside. Wasn't there some kind of fireside chat with them? Oh, he did. Um, Coyote and Sledgehammer, I believe, did a fireside chat on the Triglavian uh, Discord. Oh, okay. Was that yep. specific to Triglavians or was it just well, the whole thing? No, they have, there were specific questions from, but they did it on the Triglavian Discord. Like on both the Triglavian and the Edencom Discord, there's like a, a CCP channel, but they, they, um, they talk more in the Triglavian Discord. I oh, think. did that sting? A little bit, but we, <laughs> we we like strong. They were at first only in the Triglavian Discord, but we like ha we like kept poking them, and a lot, a lot of CCP piled in, and they they answered questions really really well when we ping and such. It, and a lot of the information that's pinged in one won't be pinged in the other, and that that goes both ways. But they did the fireside chat for the Triglavians, but um, we like reposted all the the stuff that was said in our Discord. And a lot of it just applies to like, just both of us, right? What are the highlights? Um, let me break out the. Well, some of the highlights include um, how they, they talked about uh, how the systems that spawn on Serenity and the systems that spawn on Tranquility are from a different bucket. And uh, as you know, if you do the invasions, that when something goes in one way on serenity the chinese server it gets mirrored over on our server um the liminal candidates so if they go fortress or liminality they get mirrored over our to our server and vice versa so serenity lost niarja without ever getting to fight for it right because it just mirrored our niarja loss so they just woke up one morning and niarja was gone with no invasion right watch yeah. watch would sting right <laughs> Assuming they have the tra same trade hubs. I'll see if I um, think they do. See if I know they need grab, to uh, I'm going to try to reach out and grab Fonsway here. Uh, he's, he's uh, I think, hey, Fonsway, how's it going? You're not a Kybernaut, are you? I, I've got the uh, document open now. Oh, okay, good. Nar Narja couldn't have spawned on Serenity. Um, they, let's see, let's see. What would they say to the high sect people uh, about Nyarja? Um, uh, about high sect not becoming high sec? There was They're an article. Yeah, there was an article in PC Magazine as well about uh, Nyarja and stuff. We'll pick that up in just a second. The uh, finishing up on Triglavians, Fonsue, are you there? Did you attend that by chance? Uh, so I, I've followed the course of the invasion. I haven't like gotten my character specifically involved in the battles, obviously. Right. You heard about that fireside or the devs? Yeah, talking? I read. I read through that interview. Yeah, I know they talk to you a lot uh, about this sort of stuff. Is there anything in that? Um, a lot of the question, a lot of the questions are like, I can't answer that. They did mention something about yeah. the captured transmuter in Arshat, which is gonna. I think it's gonna be left over as like a monument of the war. Oh, so, so Arshat is a, is a system. So Arshat yeah. is a system in the Amar Empire. That's the one that I, I stayed up all night a few weeks ago oh, yeah. back to Redoubt from Liminality. Well, you know, when it went into Liminality, that's the state where the Triglavians <laughs> won the Stellar Reconnaissance. So they won the first bar, and it got pushed. It became low sec. It was previously high sec. But then Edencom came in and pushed the bar in the second stage all the way back up, which immediately flips it back to our second stage um, and brings the sex status back up. So our chat is the only system so far that has ever been flipped from the second stage to the other side, second stage. But when it went to uh, liminality, like the Triglavians started harvesting the star like they do with the big star harvester, so like it's like a, now it's like a captured seller harvester and it's like so it's like the only thing of its kind where like the empire came back into power after losing the power and it captured the triglavian technology once once you reach the middle stages once you're what this 
a system begins in stellar reconnaissance. Right. Once it is pushed out of stellar reconnaissance in either direction, it doesn't go back into stellar reconnaissance. It actually yeah, it just flips, flips to the all the way to the other side. Right. So the Triglavians got this system to start going their way. It built that structure, and then Edencom took the whole solar system back. Yeah, that, that was that was that was a grindy night. I was I was there for until downtime, a little after downtime. I came back on after downtime. So one of the one of the interesting uh, parts of that particular fireside was the discussion of the synchronization between serenity and tranquility. Basically, what was said is that they both rely on the same database for the map, which means that they both have to have the same security status for all the solar systems. And that is the reason why they're synchronizing uh, the, system, the, the invasion states between them, which is a huge, like, I, I personally take issue with this uh, portion of the invasion. Like, a lot of to have a system, do. yeah, to have a system that goes one way or the other, literally without your ability to impact it, that undermines the entire concept of chapter three, which was you get to choose. So the, in that interview, Coyote said, well, you know, we kind of didn't have a choice. So uh, we, you know, we did what we had to do, which is we made a bucket of systems that are only going to be determinable by tranquility and a separate bucket of systems that are only able to be determined by player actions on Serenity. In other words, they were never going to get a shot at Nyarja. It was never going to happen. Nyarja was always going to be determined by tranquility. Uh, they said they tried to split up the systems into the ones that are important to each server. So Nyarja is important to us and not to them, so they let us determine Nyarja. But that's, I understand they're in a sticky situation that both servers need to end up in the same state in terms of security status, and this is the best solution they could come up with, but this is a huge red flag. I don't what know. if uh, what if Serenity got Gita? How, how great would that be? <laughs> I, so so salt inducing. Asked in the interview. Asked in the interview as well was are trade hubs valid? And he said, I can't answer that, but you should know the answer already. And I think that so once and for all, I would like to respond to the lol Gita is gonna be nullsec because everybody like fantasizes or jokes or memes about this, like pretty much in every conversation of security status change, they're not eligible. For God's sake, folks, stop joking about it. It's not even funny. One important thing to say about Serenity is that they've had zero liminality is pushed on their side. Um, Serenity has pushed only fortresses. The, there is a small, the fire side said there is a small Triglavian group on Serenity, but it just seems like there's a lot more players pushing for Edencom on Serenity. And there was some stuff on Hobo Leaks about like daily events where you got SP for killing Edencom ships, which were pushed to Serenity. So it's like they're having a hard time getting the Serenity players to fight for the Triglavians, I think, because every Triglavian invasion has that can go liminal has been pushed to a fortress, which is the Edencom victory state. Um, on Serenity, so we've only gotten fortresses, and they just keep getting stuck with. Well, they both are fortresses and our liminalities because we get both. Because we have um, our our two set like both of our sides are more organized than what is on Serenity, according to the fire side. Can Can I defend myself now? You may. <laughs> uh, okay, because I'm just speaking for myself and Ashtarothi and Er Zero X. Um, just because they are not part of the invasion does not mean that we're not going to get a grand finale that is Jita by Christmas. You think Jita will be taken over by Triglavians? I think there's going to be an invasion, a big one. And I think so it's going to be I, I will take trip. that bet, Caleb. Some of the people on, like, like, a lot of people have, like, a lot of big hopes about, like, a finale or, like, what's going to happen to the systems at the end. And... A growing number of people, and I think I'm included in this, is that I think some people are thinking too pie in the sky and getting their hopes up too much. Because you look at like even Niarja, it doesn't like it it makes the route from Amar to Jira a lot longer, right? But it doesn't like really fundamentally change the game, I think. Yeah. And I think I, it's I didn't not say gonna... it was gonna flip. I said it was gonna be the location for the finale. No, I did I don't don't mean that 
you said it was going to flip, but I think a lot of people are expecting a lot more of that. And I'm not even saying you in this, but I think some people are like saying the systems will be removed from the map and become like their own wormhole stuff interconnected. And people are getting a little crazy. Okay. So, uh, Gita, maybe, maybe not. We'll see by Christmas. Um, these are the... I think uh, there was something that's very interesting here that we want to reemphasize, and that is that systems that are taken in Serenity, which is the China server, uh, and obviously off limits to us, and, and we're off limits to them, that influences what we see on our map and vice versa. And I wonder if that's not an interesting way of actually combining the servers. It's kind of like a parallel universe. It's well, just I mean, like it was it's like it was stated. Right? It was stated to be based on a technical limitation, as in both yes. both of those servers have to call back to the same map data. But it's a horrible, horrible way of solving that because it basically it. it basically puts first it puts a really good a, uh, player agency aspect into the game, and then because of this thing, it basically takes it away. You're basically yeah. going to have something that influences you that you do not have any influence on it's just dumb and it's dumb both ways but if anything it should only be from tq to serenity because of the whole population thing it should yeah. never ever be the other way around yeah. it's just horrible. Think you thing might be overreacting I, to that i, 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 mean, I call like, it i, I call can... it a net loss i mean it's not like sex status hasn't changed of systems before like when the game started serum prime was low sack right that's that. That wasn't player determined. It wasn't systematic. It wasn't right. That's what I'm saying. Over. It's not like stuff that you could like didn't affect change hadn't changed before. So you can just look at it that way. It's just another system that you couldn't affect that change. I mean, a little look bit. at look at space weather. You can't you can't change the weather in the system that you're in? If it happens to blow by, then you're stuck with it. Well, that's that's very time. That's you're talking days there. What so. if Serenity is behind the weather? Well, the Triglavian uh, oh boy. Matter, oh boy. Matter. Matter. right? Like the metal, uh, meta liminal storms are a product of the Triglavians. The the main issue that I have with the synchronizing of invasion states is that I I call it a net loss for player agency because we have our status quo of these are the solar systems and this is their security status. They wanted to give us something extra that like people weren't demanding and crying for the ability to change sex status. They decided to put that in as a piece of content, which was interesting, admittedly, and I like it. And they let people fight over it. And there's a lot of debate. A lot of people d didn't want that. But enough people, you know, that that's kind of balanced enough that I'm okay. It's like this is an addition and, and it's worthwhile. But then when you put in the fact that some things will be changing that are beyond our control, you're taking away even more agency than we never asked for. You're, that's worse than the status quo. Hmm. I will right. say uh, just one thing real quick, and then we can, can move on. Sure. I think players have, I mean, as long as I've played EVE, which is like 2004, players have, they may not have been shouting for it, but they wanted dynamic security status systems. Uh, they wanted to be able to change that. They want to say, hey, I mine in this system all the time, or I ride in this system all the time. How come the sec doesn't go up or down based on that? Still uh, and, also, and also, uh, to Baleful's point, uh, back in the day, and, and this is kind of maybe not a, a good argument to make, but uh, the map changed. We got extra regions. Uh, we got n new routes, new highways. Like everything has changed. Like the jump gates have gone to different directions. Oh, like you and we haven't. Like yeah, it. and we had no agency over that at all. They just it just turned over one day. Like they just flipped, flipped the switch, and it just happened. So I think this is like a better way to do those types of things. But it's just ugly when it's based on out of game force majeure, right? When when it's game when when changes are added because of factors that are not something that uh, well you could count on, right? The the highway system was taken down because of lag issues with the servers, right? So so I don't think that's a good comparison. But but this is adding agency and taking it away, and it's well, really not a good. The system. main the main issue is that. There, that all those changes were balance changes by game designers. This is content that we're not being allowed to engage in. This is player content on Serenity that Tranquility players don't have access to. That affects Tranquility players and right. vice versa. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, in, go ahead, Baleful, and then we'll wrap it up. 
the only other thing I want to mention is that there are currently two pretty big bugs in the invasion. Um, for one, systems that have been flipping read out, like the two we flipped to read out um, last night, this, like most of the sites aren't spawning. Like zero sites for the Triglavians. We flip it to read out, which means Edencom wins the first stage if a liminal candidate, a blue or G5 yellow star. And it flips to the second stage for the the Edencom victory of the first stage, Redoubt. And the sites don't spawn anymore, and the NPCs aren't fighting each other, and it's just broken. And it's oh. just really hard to push up. It fixes itself at 75, at least it did in Avspur, the one of the fortresses we won where we first saw this bug. But it happened for the second and third time yesterday um, in the MR system that's invaded currently and the Minimitar system of Gelf Ivan, which is those two just went to Redoubt yesterday. And it, it, that's unfair for the Triglavian players because they don't have the sites to push back. There's not many roaming fleets up because they're just like broken. And there's only two, uh, two emerging conduits and a minor conduit. So even the Edencom players can't push it up fast and, and unbreak it. So it, that's just like completely bjorked. And the other thing is <laughs> in the non-Amar Edencom victories and fortresses, minor victories and fortresses the orcas that drop the g gun stars which is the edencom equivalent of a wear post don't drop the the gun stars right so the orcas in galente kaldari and uh, minmatar space are broken and not deploying the gun stars they're supposed to be deploying so um ccp has been uh, alerted to both of these issues and they should be fixing it soon mm -hmm. but it, it's it's two pretty big bugs that have uh yeah, been annoying in the, the Those gun stars not being dropped is actually a problem for both sides because Edencom doesn't have their guns, and those gun stars drop loot for uh, Tregovian players to kill them. No, but because those gun stars don't drop, they're not getting put on the the gates and say the minor victory system of Bay that we just won the with that big battle over. And that means like the Triglavian roaming rats from the emerging conduit. There's not many of them, but they still exist in Bay because there's one emerging conduit in the minor victories for Edencom. Uh, can sometimes still sit on the gates in the system that Edencom won, right? So that's that's a pain in the butt because otherwise there'd be like the, the Gunstar response fleet and they'd just get like wiped out by like the Republic fleet there. I just liked how you said Bjork. Instead of the Icelandic yeah, version Bjork, of Bjork. Right. <laughs> I love it. Uh, all right, cool. So that's the Triglavian updates. Uh, there's a lot going on there. Um, one last thing, though. Bay almost got taken over, but you guys beat them back. Eden Comp, congratulations. Bay was was a pretty fun night because we, we won Bay and Gelfife, and those, neither of those could have gone liminal. So the sex status could not have dropped because they were... Bay and Gelfifen, not Gelfifen, uh, Damelin. It was Bay and Damelin on that day. Mm -hmm. They were not yellow G5 or so, blue stars. So what, was the, what was the big deal of those getting taken over by Triglavians? To minor victories, which have giant presence. Like if a Triglavian wins a minor victory, there's just tons and tons and tons of Triglavians camping the gates at like nearly all times and wear posts all over the system. And if you're not friendly to Triglavians, it's a pain in the ass to get through. And hypothetically, it should be the same in reverse now. So it should be a pain for Triglavian supporters to get through. But the gun stars are broken. Yeah, the, the, fight for, the fight for liminality is a fight for security status. If it's not a liminal candidate system, then what you're fighting over is not security status, but which faction is going to control that particular system, which impacts the players, you know, who pass through. Right, like like the gate camps in the minor victories are not a joke. Like, um, you you go to like uh, Aldic, which is a Triglavian minor victory, and like you really have to you really have to play your cards right to get in if the Triglavians are hostile to you. Um, there there are obviously ways to do it. It's not like unpassable, but like if you it's are, pretty hard, you're, I, you're, it's it's pretty hard. They it, took it, me out fast. Out. Yeah, like you, you gate into something and all of a sudden you're getting your ship stripped and destroyed right around you. Yeah, if you're, yeah, if you're not in a, if you're not in a two tick align ship, then you are going to take some hits and like, you, you have be able to get to... them. 
you have to we've been like pulling them off the gate with like an interceptor and then jumping in and warping right Just but like essentially that. not passable right like, um unless you have like they... a fleet that can jump in and kill the stuff or you do something like pull the rats off the gate like make them chase like an interceptor and leave the gates just so like you're not in scram range of you for mm -hmm. 10 seconds you can work you, so, you can usually get like a mwd cloak in too if they're not right but so like if you're a freighter pilot and you're trying to if you're, a freighter pilot, you're not getting in unless yeah, you have no. like people helping you do it an escort fleet of some sort because yeah. there's because there's points that sit on that's that are in these packs now so they will point you yeah the anchoring rats point you I got it. So the net result of Bay being taken over, which is one of the systems. So the thing about Bay being taken over is okay. So Bay's taken over. Jark and Sasta are a double fortress on the Amatar border. Demolin and uh, Osager and Teo Sunde are a uh, fortress and two minor victories. So it's really, really, really hard for a Triglavian player to enter the Republic once the gun stars are fixed. Like the the Minmatar Republic is actually surrounded by Edencom victories right now, like the fortresses on the Jark border, the the Bay victor, the Bay minor victory, the Osager minor victory blocking the Losec entrance of Amamake, the Damalin minor victory blocking the other Losec uh, access of uh, Bosberger, uh, Teosu Te Day, which is blocking the people coming from the Great Wildlands or Ethereum Reach out of Molden Heath. So, so it's then, actually uh, really neat. I was looking at the... Yeah, if you're friendly to the Triglavians, you are not getting in the Minmatar Republic once those guns are so fixed. I was looking at the, the map, right? And if Bay fell to the Triglavians, right? We talked about it. They put the the Steve, the, the Giga gun on the gate. If you were just like an unaligned freighter pilot, uh, your trip from Jita to Renz or Jita to Heck would get a hell of a lot longer, right? Um, like you're essentially cutting off not only... Uh, domain from uh, Jita, but also uh, Himitar and, and uh, Metropolis so this, as well. This is an important question that was not brought up on the higher side that I found disappointing, and that is what should we expect uh, out of minor victory systems after the invasion is over? Because chapter um, three is the end of the invasion. So somebody did ask uh, one of the devs if minor victory is going away, and they said there should, there's going to be some lasting effects, but they couldn't tell us what so everything we have on that is speculation. All right. So Aren't some gonna... some lasting effects means that they're not going to be quite as deadly as they are now. But obviously right. we can yeah. jump. One to the thing invasions. in fire news that I do want to mention, in according to these invasions, is with the four different um, empires, the rats are obviously different in each empire. Like the Kaldari rats are notoriously weak. They are buffed a little, but they're still rather weak. The Amar rats were nerfed a little. They're still a little bit strong, um, not as bad as they used to be, but the one empire that has no liminality systems, final liminality systems, is the Republic. And the main reason for that is unlike the other three empires, the Republic, the locals who live there, and the militia and the, like the Minmatar RPRs are like turning out in full force in most of the Republic invasions to the point where a lot of the Triglavians don't like going to the Republic. Like it's actually really cool to see like, um, these people who are like really into defending their territory. And I'm really disappointed I'm not seeing it in the as much in the other areas. Like um, you see it with some of the Amar role players, but like none of the Amar militia almost. And it's it's kind of sad. I was hoping like the militias would be more into, yeah, defend our territory, but some of the Kaldari ones were at the start, but Cal defending Kaldari is depressing. <laughs> Just the rats are bad. Okay, another thing about Bay that we need to bring up is why it's uh, so important. I like this idea, by the way, of Eden Kong protecting the Republic. It's very counterintuitive, right? Like the the poorest and most dismissed empire in space has the strongest because police all force. All the locals like actually banded together to defend their space. Like like every invasion of the Republic, which is first of all, they have the least invasions because they have the least amount of space. They're just proportionally. They get hit yeah. the least, but like every Republic invasion, like every local and like the Minmatar militia turns out in like really overwhelming force and it's, it's inspiring, but yeah, like, um, 
It is kind of cool. Bay, bay being, uh, Bay is important though, because yeah. it's, people call it the Min Matar version of Nyarja. It's, it's a choke point that leads from the Heck and Ren's pipe to Galente and Kaldari's space. And so if you want to go from like Ren's and Heck to, to Jita, you, you have to go through Bay, right? And um, so if Bay fell, that would be another difficult point to get through in the new Silk Road that exists because of Nyarja falling. Yeah, you, you wouldn't be able to. You'd have to go through a low sec or in the Arja, right? Like, there's no way around well, it. It would have, or like, you'd have to be friendly with the Triglavians to get through Bay, but you can't do that because, like, a few jumps that way, there's two Eden Calm fortresses that you have to go through, right? So it's yeah, a really neat everybody... way that uh, CCB everybody... are kind of splitting up the map, right? So it felt like for the longest time everything was really close, right? So if I wanted to go to to Renz, it was like the shittier. Uh, trade hub, right? But it was still a trade hub, and that area was, it never felt like it was off limits to me, right? With all of this happening, the map feel, at least high sec, feels like I got to live in Galente space. And... Did you guys see the, uh, the video I shared of the most heroic moment of the Bay fight with the smart bombs? No. I put it in the staff channel um, after Bay happened, but one of the, the stronger alliances on the Edencom side, Phoenix Naval Systems, um, warped 12 smart bombing practices right onto the, one of the Triglavian uh, uh, site fleets. They, they only killed like like a handful of ships, but like local dropped by like 30, and Edencom just kind of ran away with the system after that because when, it's a tug of war, and they basically kicked the Kybernauts down. So everybody's making a very big deal about the security status changes and the Silk Road and the Arja and all this stuff. But the that road is like a gigantic minefield right now with with the, the faction situation with the minor victories. Like if those get tuned down after the invasion is over, then that's a different story. But as of right now, like it is it is absolutely not safe along many many points along that route not just Niarja. like that freighters will not make it all the way through if they don't plan appropriately it's not just Niarja that's the problem right so the silk road is no more already well it never it never was it was going through those minor victories from the start it's just that those, those can be gotten around uh but a security status change is something that everybody's got to deal with there's no police for anyone if you think about this from the perspective of the original design of EVE Online and comparisons of the map and what we know from other games that are trying to cut things off with zones, this is really like a teaching experience, right? It's like it's mostly affecting, uh, at least directly, routes, right? Where ideally we would want fronts. This is why I have been arguing that this is a step towards the next iteration that is most likely going to be the empires with a similar seesaw uh, invasion thing with systems on the border. So a non uh, a demilitarized zone or a neutral zone between each of uh, of the areas of the map. Uh, Maro and I was uh, looking at the, the the old maps the other day, and you can basically say that if if you drew uh, an actual uh, line between the, the individual uh, empires and you maybe uh, recreated the chasm um, between the two halves of the map, you have something that is something that was wanted back in the day. But introducing something consequential like this that early was both technically not feasible and maybe not something you necessarily wanted in your player base. But I'm definitely seeing them doing something like that on the other side of this whole grand finale well, at, at this point if i wanted to bring a freighter alone along that 49 jump silk road from jita to amar hitting those tra uh, the trade hubs in between if i wanted to do that without other players helping me i would have to bring two separate characters two omega characters on separate accounts one of them would have to be eden comma line one of them would have to be trigger line one of them would be in a two-tick ship, and one of them would be in the freighter. And they would trade ships to go through the appropriate systems that are taken over by one side or the other. That is the only way a, a one player alone can.
can actually travel that entire road. Are there any Triglavian victories on the Silk Road right now? I know there's a couple fortresses in the Eden Combat of victories. I can double check, actually. Does this does this create the opportunity for players to, as an example, control Niarja and allow their own traders to bypass it and have an advantage by under? Well, Niarja's got no police now. Niarja's got no police. I was talking about the the one faction rats versus the other faction rats. Yeah, but um, I, what, what he's saying is like if if you want to move a freighter through Niarja faster, you can't camp it with a hundred people and move the freighter through. And that could be, totally be done. I mean, um, we brought a 70-person battleship fleet to the final liminality of system of Veil vale yesterday for an RP event to get a freighter in. So that could totally be done with the Arja. You'd probably just need a bigger fleet because there's already like a 70-person battleship fleet on the Arja. So you mean like a military escort fleet for hauling? Yeah, because they, the whole RP idea was to try to get aid to the people on the planets. Who are stuck there since the the system is being harvested and the triclavians are in control so um basically 70 of us in like vindicators and the shacks and such camped the gate into the one-way in system and they brought a, fr a freighter full of shuttles from planet to planet like because only our peers do this, this kind we of should, we should, we should clarify the... because uh, agent black bear in chat uh so i was i was describing the system you know, as it stands, the rules, as opposed to the current state of things, yeah. Agent Black Bear clarified and said there there happens to be no Triglavian minor yeah. victories on I that. Didn't on think, that. I didn't think there yeah. were. Right. But yeah, there there could very easily be that could, that could pop up and create that situation. So and, shot, and it it all it already exists the other way around. So Shotgun Messiah asks, how heavy into RP are the Eden Comms and Triglavians? Um, though there's a lot of players on both sides, and there's a lot of people who aren't. But there's a lot of people who are, and I think this event has actually gotten a lot more people into RP who otherwise maybe wouldn't have looked at it. There's been a lot of people on um, the RP channels that you haven't seen before this event. A lot of people posting on the in-character forms. The Kybernauts have a... A role play section of their discord and uh, edencom does likewise three of what i would say are probably um the main edencom supporting like alliances are like rp groups and those have been a lot of the muscle for edencom that's electus matari phoenix naval systems and kimi harar um so like there's a lot of our peers in this event which is kind of unsurprising given like the nature of like defend your empire def like and and all that um Eritaka research consortium is always involved in stuff with with extraterrestrial kind of stuff like the drifters and the triglavians so they're doing a lot of their their like science rp behind it so this has been a really good event for getting people to see the rp side of eve um and interact with the rp side of eve so not and that's once again not to say everybody doing it is is into rp some people have other reasons whether it be because they think systems should go low sec or because they want to save high sec or just because they they want something to do or they think the the, the tug of war is interesting but i think it's been a really good uh event for rp -er. so, this is also why it ties back in old history and, in, and into the future, right? Because I think we're going to be not forced, but nudged into paying more attention to and being interested in the RP and in the law of EVE Online. Because if you think about it, the invasion and the Triglavian with the Triglavians being like the rebels and the ones aggressing against the status quo of the empires and all that shenanigans, that was ideally what the faction uh, pirates were back in the day you just didn't have this massive interesting tech and, and narrative right it was very much a, a a weak backdrop right so you could rp that you were siding with sanchez or whatever uh and then fight the origin of uh of, of your pod pilot all that stuff but this time it's a much more meaningful narrative and i do think that the next step is going to be that you are basically choosing in a much more meaningful way, who you are supporting, who you are uh, bound to, and where you live. Um, at least that's uh, what I see from the Trig Invasion. 
Um, one of the, somebody in chat says, before Edencom builds guns in their minor victories, there are tackling trig rats potentially. And yes, that goes back to the broken gun stars that I said before. In Edencom minor victories, there's mostly Edencom sites, but there is one emerging conduit, which means there are a small amount of roaming triglavians. And with the non-Amar orcas not building gun stars, they can sometimes hang out on the gates. So what do you guys think is going to be the, the lasting effect of after, uh, let's, let's just say invasion ends, right? It goes however, I, I don't care how it goes, right? For the sake of the argument. What do you think is going to be like the, the big lasting effects? Because I've talked to a lot of people who do industry stuff uh, in domain, and they have pulled up everything. They pulled up all of their citadels because they can't, since they can't get through Niarja, there are some things that they can't source locally in domain. That uh, they're just like, well, if we're going to have to jump freighter stuff, I'm just going to move to Galente Losec instead because there's a lot of connections back and forth. It's closer, yada, yada. I've seen awesome. other people in domains say, you know what, we're just going to stay here. Um, that we're going to build uh, different things here. Instead of capital ships, we're going to focus instead on building uh, Tech 1 ships and doing Tech 2 like production, stuff like that that they could use a blockade runner for. What do you yeah. think is going to happen? Like what? And I guess... This is similar Not a detailed happened. picture. Oz, Oz has predicted a, de a slow decline of a mark across the board. I don't think that's going to be the outcome. I think the, the outcome is going to be that the null-centric entities are going to pick up uh, a lot of the logistic work uh, because it's going, to be, it's going to be valuable. Basically, what Manuel has talked about for ages with smuggling is kind of what's going to happen. Um, it's similar to what happened with structures where... Uh, high sec entities were controlling all high sec structures and then null sec came in. I think something similar will develop from this. And on the other side of all of this, we're going to get an alternative for the high secers based on standing, affiliation, and I think we're going to get a high sec uh, uh, highway system um, where you actually pay for your jumps. What, what did Manuel say about smuggling? Nullsec will will there will be a stronger uh, variant of uh, of Black Frog right with jump freighter networks where someone will take over that as a speciality and I would expect they would do that most likely under the TTT banner um, and that's going to be the new way that uh, people will get their stuff shipped around easily and well not cheap but not necessarily extremely expensive and definitely not labor intensive. Mm. I want to. Uh, Manuel doesn't know what he's talking about. I want to respond to a couple of the chat comments. Agent Black Bear asks, um, basically, if Edencom has been getting more numbers recently, and I would have to say that I think Niarja did pull in a lot of people to Edencom when they finally realized that, like, what was happening because Niarja was gigantic news to like almost everybody. Um, so I think there was a surge of people after Niarja. The other thing that I think is happening is that we've had a bunch of Minimitar invasions recently compared to before and Minmatar invasions have a higher turnout than the other invasions because all the locals are really invested into defending the Republic. Whereas I don't really see that same effect happening in the other three empires. And um, Neo Kaiser says this invasion um, is basically the first time that they've ever suicide ganked in high sec um, because they've ganked Edencom supporters and this Invasion has also been the first time I've ever suicide ganked in high sec. I've suicide ganked Triglavians, right? And I've played this game 10 years, mostly as a low sec pilot. And something got me to try something new in, in uh, the game. And, like, I had fun doing it, actually. Even, like, I had some really dumb losses, like, where I just failed the gank because, like, I've, I'd never done it before. Right, and I didn't use enough. We didn't use enough catalysts, or like we just landed off the thing, and they were smart and like used their MWD. But then we started hitting a few targets that were just like under, like an undertanked Zarmaz and an undertanked uh, bunch of their Lodgy, and it was really, really fun. And I have tried something that I wouldn't have tried before, and I think that's another positive to this event. Uh -oh. A lot of people are trying stuff that they're not ever trying before, whether it be suicide ganking, or we've gotten some people their first kills, we've gotten some people to go into low sec, or like the fake null sec um, systems of liminality who otherwise wouldn't leave high sec. And we've got people to fly in new ships and train into new are you turning are path. you turning to the dark side now are you gonna i mean no because i suicide ganked people who deserved it 
like not. I mean, I what would what would Concord have to say about that? I, Concord shot me, but I was shooting the people they wanted me to shoot, so they can get over it. Concord, Con- is- Concord had to do their duty. They're Concord bound by the rules. With us. I actually, oh. I actually had a big. But RC is still doing what's right. I had a big back and forth with one of the CCP devs about um, security status for killing Triglavians because there's um, PVP content, especially when the system turns to low uh, in the first stage of liminality when the Triglavians win the Stellar Reconnaissance, which is the opening stage. Um, uh, so when it, it turns to fake low sec, so you still have security status hits when you shoot each other, but the most efficient way of shooting, of winning either a low sec invasion or a uh, first liminality is to kill the other guy and then run sites uncontested, right? Because, like, that just makes sense. Otherwise, you're banging your head into a wall because you're both running sites. So you just kill them, and that's the best way to do it. But you lose security status. And for Edencom, you're basically doing the thing that Concord wants you to most do, but you're losing security status, which is basically your Concord cred, right? So, I would say one of the, the funniest things about all of this is uh, it harkens back to uh, conversations I think we had. It was either with CCP Burger or CCP Hilmar, where he went and said, you know, whenever we introduce a new feature, in the past, we try and figure out what the players would do with it. Uh, but now we've completely given up. We, we just have some ideas, and we're just going to see where it takes us. And I'm sure someone's sitting around there in a meeting saying, so we did this Triglavian invasion. It lasted two years. And one of the effects is suicide ganking way up. Like, <laughs> I mean, I think I need to push back on this false narrative you're putting out here, Baleful, because Concord doesn't want your vigilante justice. There are systems, there are rules to uphold Con- a government system and to maintain stability in the empire. I, and by violating these rules, there's a reason we have to we, abide by these rules. We have been praised by Provost Marshall. Uh, Whatever straight edge. The he ha Balkanier of Edencom for our good efforts. And the like lore wise, it like blows my mind that the uh people who are shooting the, the navies aren't going suspect. I, I've I've bitten my lip until now and I've let all this Edencom, you know, love fly. You know, I've I've let y'all get your points out, but like I think it needs to be pointed out that your your hero, Casilla Valkanir, is uh, a race trader. And so, uh, you guys are underdressed hey, for all this laughing. Hey, so <laughs> here's the thing: Cassia Vulcanier might be a race trader, but so is Arcia Elkin because I joined Electus Matari for the Free Tribes. And and I'm a race trader. Hold, hold, hold on, <laughs> before they <laughs> get to our we had a great time, but we need to bring along the audience. Otherwise, they're not going to get in on these jokes. I just want to review real quick. Well, can't we just explain after? No, All right, no. So Cassia Valkanir is uh, the head of Edencom. There is an event character for her, but she hasn't popped up yet in local, which makes me sad. But um, so That's a CCP it, character. That's not a player. Right. It's a, it's a CCP-controlled character. You'll see them with yellow text if they pop up, and you see them every so often, like you saw Chuck Cade in Flossus Win. Um, but there is a character now for Cassia Valkanir. So I assume she's going to pop up if there is some kind of finale or something. Um, and like just yell encouraging things in local. How do you um, spell this character's name? K A S I H A. Go ahead. Someone oh. just write it in chat. No. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. But um, anyway, she is uh, a former Amatar fleet veteran who is now uh, employed by Aegis, which is a division of Concord. Um, so the anybody who doesn't know the Amatar are um, basically. Uh, they are Amar loyal ethnic Minmatar who uh, be- betrayed the other tribes um, way long ago and sided with the Amar, so they were given the region of Derelict, which is semi-autonomous uh, part of the empire control uh, under the domain of Lord Ardashipur, which is one of the six royal houses of Amar. Um, Basically, they're Amar loyal ethnic Minmatar, so a lot of people see them as race traders. And Arcia is? Arcia is a ethnic Amar apostate who betrayed the empire. So somebody that worked for the slaveholders went to fight 
for this the uh, where the slaves were from. But she went to fight for the the Min. She's she's part of a Min Matari alliance now, Alexis okay. Matari. Okay, and that character is not a CCP character. No, that's that's my character. I used to be in Praetoria Imperial as Executorius for years. Um, with a more loyalist, but with a lot of the events around Kaha and, uh, and you know, from Kaha to uh, all the way to Flossus, when like a year later, there there's a lot of change in the character, reacting to a lot of the events that happened, a lot of the interactions with the characters. But that would take like three streams for me to describe. Yeah, we'll do a full. I, I have a wiki page, but that's not for now. <laughs> I have a wiki page. That's awesome. Well, I love the way you defend yourself. Good job. And defending uh, Min Matar. Yeah, for any, for anyone who doesn't know, this is this is one of the most prolific, uh, formerly Amar, apparently RP players in the community. Like That's she's nice... put out, she's put uh, out more material than like just about anyone. My uh, my character's family was attacked in one of the world news written by the devs. Oh wow! That's, uh, that's CCP Delegate Zero. I love that guy. Uh, yeah, I love your arc though, uh, working for uh, slaveholders and then defending slaves. Uh, Okay, this, this is all this is all brand life. new. Like, Ar Arzia was hardcore for like how long? A uh, decade? Yeah, it, nine years. Like, right? She was in Pi for six and a half years before leaving. Right at the onset of the Flossus one. Yeah, uh, so that, this is not just a flip flop. Arzia yeah, does yeah. not change her mind very often. <laughs> Arzia was a very hardcore ceremony. I even fought in the Amar tournament. Right, the when Jamel died, as Elise knows. <laughs> <laughs> that it's always going to get brought up. <laughs> Good sport, Elise. Okay, that deserves its own. We're going to do our own interview and get to the bottom of uh, Arceus' story because it sounds like it's it's way deep. Um, I want to ask one more question on this Triglavian stuff. Narja, is there going to be in history uh, a before Narja and an after Narja? Is that is it that important what happened this last week? Remains to be seen. I mean, I think that it will reshape uh, trade routes and trade hubs. I don't think it will fundamentally change the game. So, I think it's going to be I huge. Disagree. I think it's going to be similar to like how we view uh, like before Jita, right? I, I, maybe not at that scale, but it, it there's going be to be a moment. To the change from Uli to Jita. Yeah, I think that's going to be a, like a, that sort of level. Like, I don't want to downplay it. Like Niarja is is probably the biggest uh, system of the event and the target yeah, when, on it. When this gets talked about, uh, you know, and oh, and they 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 let us change security status and a bunch change. Yeah, we got Niarja. Like that's that's going to be the one that people talk like, about. Niarja, like honestly, out of all the systems that that matter. Niarja is the main one that the Triglavians got. Like, Rerevoss was a small pipeline to uh, Satogus and all that pocket for the Amar militia that was kind of taken away. And um, That was the first system. Yeah, other than that, uh, Ichiora was really, Ichiora, Ikoria, however you pronounce it, was very important to the Kaldari militia. But Neither one of those is like that important on the grand scheme of things. Like one system important to the Amara militia, one system important to the Kaldari militia. But uh, Nyarja was something that was important to everyone. None of the other systems that have went liminality have been important at, at all. Like there have been uh, dead end pockets like Vale that it's just it's just a, a dead end with one connection. Um, or that. So that... Sakenta is is very interesting. Like. It's three jumps from Jita. It's a dead end. It's a play. It's like a content pit right next to Jita. You could go get like fight freely there. It's going to be an interesting thing. Yeah, that's another. It's not going to get. It's not going to get talked about like Niarja will. That's another example of a system. It's just like a dead end. It doesn't inconvenience. And there is the one system in Kaldari space that had an agent that the newbie mission sent you to. That everybody was like, Senda, Senda. It was a dead end, but it had uh, an agent that a newbie mission sent you to. Uh oh. And so, like, we had, like, newbies just jumping into a meat grinder. Like, and I don't know if that's been changed or, or something, but I think it should be if it's... <laughs> well, so, so Sakenta was uh, Mike Azariah's base of operations with the... Oh, yeah, that there. was for his... So had, yeah, so he had, a, he had a move. He so actually, I, I, I Mike gave Azariah him has actually been on Eden Com side since that. He's, yeah. he's been in a few of our fleets. Cool. I think in a year... Omar is like the second biggest trade hub and domain in that entire area is going to like slowly wither away. 
and it's going to be replaced by like Dodixie. I think you're wrong. It, it's going to be Yule again. I think Dodixie is going to be the big winner too. I think Amar is going to become Helium Mart. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna get we're gonna get you lay back. We're gonna get the highways back, and we're gonna further split the maps. Well, okay. So, so the, Caleb, yeah. you're describing you're describing a future like if further changes are made by the devs, like Retired. getting getting highways back. But I so, mean, I could so let, what we're looking at here is what what's gonna ha- what what will the player response be if things remain the way they are now? I think the player response is Red Frog gets rich. So I think that on the point of you lie, I, I don't think Jita's going to be the fi- finale, but I think you lie could actually be a finale, a big fight in you lie for the Concord home system. And maybe if the Eden Con wins, it gets fortified and returned to glory. Well, mine is that uh, you lie and or at least the surrounding systems of you lie will become the new new barriers and you lay will be the new they've been, old they've been talking trade about hub doing that for and, a long time um, and you will get you will get highways to all the individual uh, areas of space but in a way that actually costs you money or you will require security status they've and been then everything else becomes UI, smuggling a ui finale isn't happening because that would mean that the, that the troglavians are attacking edencom but they're not they're just trying to take systems to live in they, they, they do not. They're not interested in wiping out Concord or Edencom. Mm-hmm. All right, Elise, well, last take. What's It's yours. What? Why do you think uh, there'll be a, a Dodixie eclipsing Amar as a trade hub? Oh, just because uh, just right now traveling from anywhere in the south to Jita, where a lot of players go, even maybe more casual players, even the hardcore players always go through Jita. Um, that route to Dodixie is so much easier. The, the reason Jita became popular in the first place is because of uh, missions and uh, like NPC missions are really big in Dodixie and that entire area. So I really think just proximity, you know, easy, accessible, low sec nearby for, for building and reactions. Uh, and just the people I've talked to, they're saying, you know what, screw this. Uh, it, it's too hard. It's not worth it. I'm, I'm not super invested here in domain. I'm pulling all my shit up and going to uh, yeah. uh, make That's sense. The- as the travel ways get harder to trans to to pass, uh, you end up it becomes more expensive or more time consuming. Either one of those is a cost, and so instead of dealing with all that, you're just going to do whatever's easier. And you think that's the Dodixie to Jita combination? So- yeah, I, I, and and that uh, like even with the the mechanics, it's really there's no one system where you can cut it off. Um, so I, I don't think that's going to be an issue. So again, Oz, Oz's prediction is that Amar slowly just goes away. Well, this is the thing. There's going to need to be some kind of market to service the South. Uh, Baleful said it's going to become Helium Mart, which is the fuel that Amarians use. Hilarious. Yeah. But, but does Amar even need to be in Amar anymore? Can it shift to a more favorable jump point, for instance? I feel like that would be sad, Panda, because that's the capital system of the Empire. So if it's going to okay. be anywhere, right? Like Amar it should be there. Well, the, so the area has to be served, and the gateway to the area is Niarja. So even if there is, you know, some market that arose on the other side of Niarja, the stuff would have to go through Niarja and make it to Amar eventually. I wonder if like something could pop up in like Derelict, like so it's a little closer to Jita, but it cuts off like ten, fifteen jumps to Amar, and it's still in the south. I'm, Again, I'm if, it's, at... if it's not all high sec the whole way through, then it's not going to beat the Silk Road. Well, it would be a, it'd be something like Tanu or like uh, Sasta. Mm-hmm. Okay, so maybe a new trade hub sprouts, maybe a few, but uh, the South will. Uh, well, Oz says South uh, wise again. Uh, you were about to say that. Oh, no, I could tell. <laughs> well, I wasn't. I wasn't. <laughs> Um, in the context so, of Eve. Yeah, yeah. In the context of Eve, right? We're talking about all this social stuff that's uh, put into the game so we can deal with it there. Um, but okay, so there may be different scenarios out there, but basically, um, Amar is going to go through some change. Either it gets bigger or it gets smaller, or maybe there's more regional. Jim Blackbird stuff. made a good point right there. Um, yeah, there like, is one of the regions with the most asset safety stuff. Stuff goes the that point in system, like all that. And you always see fire cells there. Imagine if there is a trade like a 
I know there's like a trade for desire in SAS and a trade for desire in Tenu next door. Mm -hmm. but like imagine if there was like like a, a bigger market there for all that like all the stuff that gets asset safety literally next door. Right. Well Podion is another one of those asset safety uh sites and yeah, that, that's that's in Derelict, yeah. That's that's what he was saying, and I think that's actually a really good point. Yeah, and plus Derelict would, Sorry, Derelict can actually you. reach so Derelict can actually reach all the way into uh, Immensia, which is nice. So I think you look at uh, Podian, Derelict, that relationship with uh, the NullSec, and you might look at Providence and how it develops over time now that uh, now that it's in flux as well. Uh, and what what you know, and that bumps up into Devoid, and Podian and Devoid are kind of connected through Rahul Mahalan or something. So there's an interesting combination of things that can happen. Does have that connection to domain too yeah the direct connection yeah well you're in uh providence aren't you artemis are you hiding uh, out in providence yeah noir is a member of rc is that a secret and uh <laughs> rc lives heavily in providence when you mentioned podion being a, a possible system like that is a regular travel point if you're heading to and from trade hubs in RC. yeah like, it's noir like is... the go ahead. ignoitan of the south basically but go ahead sorry i was just gonna say like as far as Noir is concerned, if you want to head down to the south and be serviced by a market, stop by 9UY. There happens to be a free port there. Sell your wares or buy some more. Market. What have you. Yep. So it's the pirate market. That's the, that's the whole geo, uh, politics that's going to change, right? Uh, geography is, is being changed by this. That means that the null entities will also be forced to somehow decentralize and make this into a new and more efficient system. And I still think that something like Red Frog is going to eventually fold into TTT because that's the natural progression. I would just like Fun Sui to maybe comment on the whole Sino thing, which we discussed in an earlier episode. Which which one? Uh, it's just the uh, quantum is pointing out that, that some of these things should be. Uh, more like proper uh, security and not this uh, fake uh, low and fake fake null. Oh yeah, so we we discussed in the past that uh, the the null security spaces that are being created by the invasion, by final liminalities, are not true null sec. They're trig sec. They uh, it 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 is only the removal of uh, crime watch, which means there's no bubbles, no bushes, no bombs, and no sign. Well, there's Sinos if it was originally low sec. Yes, if it was if it was originally because low sec systems are also invaded at the same rate as high sec systems. Yes, so, so it basically retains the properties of its original security status minus Concord gate guns and security status hits when it turns null. Yeah, it's just it's just a crime watch system that is impacted and nothing. Although else. in first liminality, you see clone soldier rats when it's low sec. I did. I had heard that actually. Yeah, so, you see clone soldier rats in the belt. The the low sec only rats to drop the security tags. You see them in the belts in low sec. So we were we were discussing what these systems should be. Um, they ended up this way because this is what was practical in terms of manpower. You know, dev hours, etc. This is what they were able to code, and uh, a full security status change wasn't practical, but. We've kind of discovered something new here, and uh, I'm interested in the the both the Edencom and Triglavian players' thoughts on what those like what the rules should be. A should they stay the way? Should they stay the way they are, or or should do you want it to become full null sec? I know? would say more people than not. Um, and like it, by more people than not, I mean maybe 55, 45, like not overwhelming, um, like there being space that is freely engageable with no hot drops. Um, but a lot of people want to use bushes and and bubbles and stuff. Yeah. Some people the don't four, like bubbles, but the four like specific, bubbles. Yeah, the four specific restrictions that, that are on the table here are bubbles, bushes, bombs, and sinos. Those are the four things that we, you know, in, in the case of high sex system that became null. Right. That's what's on the table here. So do we want all of them? Do we want some of them? I will say, if you put industrial sinos back in Indonesia, I'm already totally fine. Uh, yeah. They can hop Is it right still through. a thing where you can um, bastion a marauder on a gate and it will bounce the jump freighters before they can jump? Or has that been fixed? 
That sounds really niche. I mean, I'm Don't thinking know. if we're going to start like having a bunch of jump traders come into Niarja and you know exactly where they're going, it's going to be a constant flow, someone's going to do it. But I do like the idea of there being some like fighting space where you can't hot drop, you can't use caps, because there's so much of the fighting res revolves around the capital fleets in low and null sec. All right. Um, we were going to jump to null sec uh, issues and actually a little bit of wormhole stuff since we just had a second episode of the uh, Noikus connection with uh, Tiberius. He had to leave, unfortunately, but check that out. That'll be on YouTube today, and we're going to release it as a podcast on your Talking Stations podcast, so you'll probably hear it with uh, this one if you're just listening to the podcast. Uh, as far as uh, the MER, are we able to bring up some of those charts, Artemis? I know it's short notice. Maybe we can't grab those. Uh, but are there any highlights that you want to point to any of you guys uh, on the MER that's uh, interesting? I mean, aside from Owasa? Yeah, MER is the monthly economic report, and it's just come out for the last month. Uh, and I'm wondering if we saw anything there. Caleb, you shot first with... Caleb shot first with Owasa. What's going on with Owasa? Uh, I, I, I don't think I, I should do any conclusive uh, comments, but uh, damn, there's a lot of productivity going on down there. Uh, as far as NPC ratting, they're... Uh, what were they at? Some trillions? They're over yeah, six they're at the trillion. top by far. Over See, that, six that, trillion. That, that looks like some, some Delve numbers, and it's like crazy. Okay, so why, why wasn't there a secret criticism when Delve was doing it, uh, now that they're doing it? Are there more people in Delve? Is... Well, it's, it's more the whole who is doing it and uh, how long have they been there. And uh, it's, you know what it is. So I, you can say it if you want. I'm not. Okay, for sake of the audience catching up on what what are what's being talked about because it's talking in stations, right? Like, what are some of the secret things that people are saying behind the scenes? And one of the criticisms is that uh, Owasa is dominated right now uh, by fraternity, and fraternity is essentially harvesting the heck out of that place, running a bunch of. Uh, ratting uh, missions so their income is enormous right now as you can see six trillion in the last month alone just from that kind of behavior and and it, this okay chat is already mentioning bots right this bot is in all groups they're also potentially rmt is in all groups there's also uh shit lords let's not talk about groups let's just talk about the scale of this this is like explosive and that amount of wealth generation is just something that uh, triggers my spidey sense. And uh, well, I, I, I'm, I'm expecting, uh, well, well, of course, uh, everyone is blue, so it could be happening everywhere. It's just uh, remarkable that it's only happening or mostly happening in Oasa. But, but what's changed? There's a, a war that's occupying Horde, and uh, certainly test and certainly uh, delve is shut down for the most part. I don't think they registered too high on the list. So Wasa is unmitigated and the people who live there are not a major part of this war at the moment. It seems to me that those are perfect ingredients for tripling your productivity. Or but, and, and, and if you have the manpower or the number of alts or whatever, uh, and you're part of Pappy, right now is a very, very good time to do some crabbing because it's going to be very difficult for anyone to really effectively stop you. But the only place that we've really seen this ramp up is Wasa. And I just I, think that's... That's true. That's quite true. I mean, number two on the list is Cobalt Edge right up there, also in PandaFam space. And you've got Paragon Falls, which is prime um, legacy space branch, which Fraternity just took over. Like, am I wrong that Fraternity is still pushing sort of in the northern arc, coming over from the week? And then also Kavala Expanse, again, used to be Horde space. I guess they've moved back in and started ratting again. But I don't think it is a case that it's just Owasa. I think basically anywhere that's not Imperium space is having a good time right now. Yeah, and that, that's to be expected. I, I just think some of these numbers are um, a little bit iffy. That seems to me to be the intent of the war. At least you can come right in after this. Uh, the 
that this is supposed to be a long war by shutting down the opportunities of Delve to make money on an individual level and to keep that pressure up until it becomes so unfun that people say, you know what, I'm going to leave because money is being made, you know, money is being made in legacy or in a hard space. What am I doing waiting this out? This is going to take months. I'm going to go play somewhere else. I think that's one of the strategies of Pappy coming into Delve. It's not to wipe it out. It's to put enough pressure on it to shut it down. What do you think, Elise? So I, I think uh, you've touched on an interesting point that maybe people hadn't uh, necessarily considered. So uh, I think Vili and ProGod had uh, like a state of test uh, almost two months ago now. And they said their goal was to destroy goons uh, and then you know, be the good guys or whatever. I, I, it was it was a little out there, and, and I thought it was a little bit off base, but they've since refined it, and it's been good. Um, but you you mentioned that uh, everywhere else is making money, right? Delve is the one that's being kind of strangled uh, shut. And for the longest time, Delve was the one making all the money in the game. They were the ones that would, you know, give me everyone you want. You know, it's not just... You don't have to be a something awful member to join Goon Swarm anymore. That that ended decades ago or a decade ago, right? So the goons started taking on more and more bodies. And this war, you're starting to see it one of the effects. I don't know if it was the primary effect, but it is an interesting uh, necessarily. Ne wow, I'm stumbling over words today. <laughs> it is an interesting effect where some of these people are saying, the people who just joined to make money are saying, well, I can't make money anymore. I'm going to go somewhere else. It's a small trickle. It's a very small trickle. But a small trickle over the course of a year um, would be pretty significant, right? So you're letting, uh, and we're, we talked about this before, I think everyone fighting in this war recognizes that fraternity are the huge winners. No matter what happens, uh, goons die, fraternity wins. Test dies, fraternity wins. Stalemate, fraternity wins. Like everything's coming up fraternity right now, uh, especially when you look at the, the income that they're making in Owasa. And these guys are a relatively new alliance, in at least in macroscopic, macroscopic EVE Online terms. Goons have been around since the server turned on. They're Test has been around for the longest time. So these guys are very much playing, at least they feel like they're playing catch up. Uh, and I think they're they're going to start lapping people real soon. Yeah, this is also why it was so funny when really uh, countered my argument with, what are they going to gain? I was like, well, you can see what they're going to gain. It's very obvious. Uh, the, they're gaining uh, wealth, I guess. They're gaining wealth. They're gaining momentum. They're gaining hot bodies. Uh, well, at least we suspect that they're mostly hot bodies. Um, they're just growing like crazy. And on the other side of this war, they could end up being the new goons because everyone else is going to be licking their wounds and uh, basically they won. So when, when I said, well, these guys are eventually going to start funding this war uh, and be the major uh, money and assets uh, income for Pappy, really said, well, what are they going to gain from that? Well, you can see what they're going to get. <laughs> it's like obvious. I mean, we are seeing one of the byproducts of the, this war so far. It, the last week, the last 10 days, has very much been a stalemate um, from all sides. Like, everything's kind of slowed down a lot. But you see the Pappy side has now taken the MER away from the Imperium. It's no longer a recruitment tool for them. It's no longer something that they can uh, meme about and boast about. You know, it, it started as a joke, but it became a real thing. That, like, hey, look, we're making all this money. Come join us. That's gone now. The goons don't, or the Imperium doesn't have that uh, anymore. That's true. The Dell time unit is definitely tanking like crazy, um, and it's being shifted to the o Oasa time unit. Right. Uh, well, and that's an interesting thing because one of the uh, what had happened in the in Eve Online is that uh, after the Imperium lost their space in the North, which way they were kind of they said overextended and not quite right, they were out of shape basically. A lot of people left their group, uh, and they slimmed down to a really tight group of very dedicated players, and those are the ones that came south and started up Delve. And when they built Delve, the idea was to build it into a secure area. They were able to do that. Then they were able to be left alone because nobody really challenged them or whoever did didn't do uh, enough damage to them. They grew slowly and methodically. And then the story started coming out, look, we're safe. 
if you want to make money, come here. And they attracted business, basically. And those people then augmented the numbers of the Imperium to the great big uh, empire that it is today. But a lot of that was built on the image of success and the image of basically um, fortune. And so also a lot of that is, you know, so the Imperium for a very long time, although they have had renters, they are, or at least goons themselves have been very much against renters, right? That was one of the things that uh, drove them in Delve 1 and Delve 2 for going in the way, way back machine. Um, Band of Brothers had the, the greater Bob community, which was essentially renters. Um, and goons just morally opposed that. And you see Asher's post uh, about how Eve are the good guys and or how goons are the good guys. And he's like, yeah, we, we hate renters. We hate the idea of renters. What the Imperium did is they opened up to renters, but they also integrated them, right? So they, they essentially did the same thing. But instead of just leaving them as tiny little fiefdoms that are renting from you, they integrated them into the Imperium. And that gave them like a huge advantage, not only in being able to make money, but being able to, uh, you know, just have bodies uh, to, to do everything with. It was a huge, huge advantage. I would say it's probably more important to the rebuilding than it was just making money, right? It is getting that, that new talent, that new crop of people. Yeah, it's the Hadrian solution, right? It's what Emperor Hadrian did in, in real life history when he gave pretty much everyone citizenship. And in, in, in goons, it basically, or, or the Imperium as they rebranded, it basically integrated and improved the social cohesion because you don't necessarily uh, socially integrate with a renter. It's enough to know one guy or something like that in a group that's renting. And he might be a little bit so socialized into the group that he's renting from, but he's still just an outsider. And again, I'm speaking from firsthand experience because that was how I got into the Bob barbecue when I was actually a renter. So the, this is just, mm -hmm. if, if I had integrated my entire group instead of just me and uh, uh, the upper echelons of my group, that would have been a much bigger force that Bob could have carried around, right? Of course, then we start talking about cutting fat and all that stuff. But the point is, it was a win to get rid of the renter model and do a proper integration model. All right. Well, either way, what we're seeing in this war so far is, you know, this has been a big hit to the Imperium. It's probably their most significant uh, loss, really, right? So they've lost uh, fountain, right, and everything in there, which represents a lot of money, like a trillion esque or something, died there in just structures alone. But being able to take this this away from them, it's making me wonder, like, hey, maybe maybe a stalemate is good for Pappy, right? Like, the Imperium morale is still high. Like, they're still able to win fights on the battlefield. But if this lasts for a year, maybe those people that integrated are going to say, hey, you know, I'll integrate somewhere else. That's because the trillion today is a dime and a dozen. This is also why I don't understand this endless talk of TTT money. TTT money is nice beer money, and it can support something like this movement towards Delve, but it cannot support the numbers that's going to be on the other side in any shape or form. So, so we should stop arguing the whole thing that, that TTT is paying for this war, because, well, it's not a war yet. It's a prologue to war. Well, that's another thing that came out of the MER is where's the war? Because it's not showing up as it's far as economic. Negative. Data. Economically, it looks like a, a, it's a negative effect. Usually you get a massive spike in, in, in destruction and it goes way above uh, production and it stays like that until, well, until it peaks and then the war is kind of over. Uh, it's just we've not seen that. We've seen the opposite, that it actually dips. So it's lower than normal. Uh, so it's not a war yet. It is still just a massive What's prelude. What's the takeaway of the MER saying that less things are being destroyed? Yeah. What's the takeaway from that? What, are, what can we... Okay, um, this is what I tried to explain when I think we had Tiberius on in one of the daily shows. What you get is you get this lull or this si um, silence before the massive uh, push, uh, before the actual storm hits, right? And usually that just pauses things a little bit. But in this case, because it's pretty much everyone involved, it completely negates uh, destruction because anyone uh, in the Pappy forces, they're mostly at least not shooting each other. Uh, so there is no destruction. Um, everyone is hunkered down in Delve, so they're not coming out and shooting stuff uh, at the same level as normal. So 
the only ones that could have picked up a little bit of uh, destruction would be losses from from pve and they're just always negligible right it's just not happening um so you see this massive dip instead because everyone is waiting for the for the crunch anybody else want to weigh in on that i mean i think it's really hard to speculate right yeah. so i mean this this mer is from a while ago too it's not uh it doesn't really encapsulate some of the most recent fights. Um, I mean, the, the early days of the war was very much like a poke, poke, poke to see what comes down. But yeah, I, I think we'll see more coming in. Also, you know, a lot of people stopped taking supers to rat in, not only because of obviously in, in Delve people were killing them, but they just became not not good, right? There, there's no point to to use them over something else. They were rather too risky. Well, the uh, go ahead, Mineral. Can you lock the channel, please? I'm gonna, I thought I did. I don't know why this guy keeps jumping in. Well, we'll in the wrong channel. That. I do want to just point out that while ratting has gone significantly up, mining is still conquered by high sec region rather than L sec region. Is this the result of just a, a taste and preferences thing between the two different coalitions? Is this of all the Rorqual changes, we think about mining not going up, but instead ratting going. I mean, there have been the, the Rorqual has been nerfed over and over and over again, right? So I think people have realized that ratting is the easiest way to go. Uh, some people will also say ratting is the easiest thing to bot. I don't think that's the case, but whatever. Um, there's always been, and and I, I did want to address this a little bit, and, and people might accuse me of like fanboying fraternity or whatever but um there's always when there is a language barrier and a cultural barrier between two groups one like one group always says the other one because they have no insight onto what they're doing because there are these cultural barriers they say oh these guys must be botting uh, and i think it's not something we just let linger out there when i was um like when I was playing Eve in the 2008 era, 2008 to 2012, everyone was like, "Oh, DRF, they're all botting. They're they're all botters. All those Russians are botters." And it turned out that there were some real bad people in there. There were some people isk, uh, selling isk in there, but they weren't all botters, right? Like <laughs> the same like numbers happened when uh, like Europeans and Americans moved into that same region, right? They were able to pump out the same amount uh, of wealth. So I, I do want to just caution people when they say, oh, well, all fraternities are botters. That's why they get the, the, the big numbers on the MER. Well, one of the things with the fraternity space up in like Alasa, it's like there's no nearby NPC null to like store dreads in. And like they, it's a lot harder to attack with any real force. Yeah, but it's got good true sec. I'm sure there are a lot, I'm sure there are some bad apples in there. I have no doubt. I'm not saying there are no botters in fraternity, but I'm just saying because I keep seeing people in chat say, "Oh, the only reason is is botting." They're they're just all botting. I don't think that's necessarily the case. They also have like a policy where like you have like one person in the standing fleet and like one ratter, and like everybody has to like have something like that. I think the the simplest way to counter the botting argument is that botters don't PvP. And I don't think anyone can discount fraternities. I will say, so someone says, oh, they're all botting for sure. Have you ever roamed the region? Yeah, I have, unfortunately. Anytime you come into the local, they're all safe. Anytime you go through a choke point system, the next five systems are safe. Um, I, you can do that without botting, right? That happens in Imperium space as well. That happens in... They also uh, respond with overwhelming force to anybody poking in that area. Like you, you yeah. bring like two battle cruisers and all of a sudden a Titan and like uh, 400 things bridge onto you. Yeah, it's it's a notoriously it's unfun not, place to yeah, roam because they will camp you for six hours. They will literally spend six hours camping you. If you're like, oh, just duck, duck into this side system, wait a few minutes, then come out again. They will stay there camping that gate for six hours. They really do. They really do. I'm impressed. Okay, just, just to defend myself a little bit, because chat is going a little bit bonkers saying that I can't say that it's not a war yet because that's me spinning. Well, it's really not because really has said this himself. It's not really a war yet. It's a prologue to a war and we're only in one of his, his moon phases. I don't know. Uh, but the point is, it's not started yet because the numbers are saying it's not started yet. It's not, it's not me trying to spin a narrative. It's just what the numbers are showing us. 
This is the glassing of fountain, everyone. This isn't actually. Get that up there. <laughs> All right, nice comparison. Well, okay, so let's actually move into NullSec from the monthly economic report. Um, what are some of the things? This last week has been kind of quiet. It seems like a lot of stuff has been happening since the move. When we saw a giant fleet of uh, super capitals move from the south up into the north. Now that there is a whole Keepstar Road uh, from Cash to essentially Fountain, well, actually Iridia. Um, and they've really moved into an area where, as we talked to Billy, he said they have a three, three prongs into Delve should they want to use them. Uh, what do you think the current state of the war is, and uh, what do you think is going to happen this next week? Well, so maybe... the, the Fountain Front, I'll just cover the Fountain Front really because that's where we're active. Uh, after White Eyes 2, uh, like two weeks ago, the Fountain Front uh, slowed down significantly, right? It's, it's much more measured. There's still stuff dying every day. Um, Keepstar died in OTEC N. The next one, the KVN final timers, I think, tomorrow. I, I could be wrong. Uh, so that region is going slow, but it is uh, a slow grind where more and more infrastructure is dying. I think 10 uh, like significant, which is like Fortis or, or higher citadels have died in the week. Um, so it's, it's much more slow and measured, but PanFam uh, and that entire group over there on the fountain front are very much just like doing a slow march towards White Ash 2. Uh, in Quirius, like that area has like started to have a little bit of moments, uh, a little, a few little sparks. So that's one of the prongs that that Vili has mentioned, right? If there's a, the fountain prong. There's the prong. There's the Quirius prong, and then there's another one just like right on the edge where they meet in period basis. So the G magic prong. It looks well, like the Imperium it... has been dropping a bunch of Athenors and Esoteria and Impasse and generally in Legacy space. Happened upon all of those lost mails today. Yeah, Boat came on last week and was like, hey, we dropped 69 of them for, for the memes. Um, that was their, their big, like, that, that was their version of warfare. It right? is making you grind a structure. Ha 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 ha. Uh, those have, I think, all been cleared up by now. It's a poop bomb. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, okay. Yeah, and, and, structures is a pain in the ass. And, and, and to be fair, um, the interesting thing from my perspective, and I know that half of uh, chat might get triggered by this, is that there's a fast momentum of the prologue to war that Vili was also pointing out when he was uh, on the show, that he was surprised that it had actually gone uh, so fast and that the fountain was already pretty much done. And what then happened in my narrative is that the last few keep stars kind of got a little bit uh, defended and then the kvn catastrophe hit and the momentum kind of got lost a little bit otherwise they should be on the way into delve by now in my opinion and i think that was also what uh Billy was expecting because that's what uh, the the prognosis was saying but um, why tech 2 that whole oops uh, and then the KVN just after with the servant uh, node crashing, that pretty much uh, halted that no momentum a bit. So now they have to finish those two before they want to do their final approach in one of those three locations that you're talking about. On the Imperium side, they've defended themselves uh, lately, and there hasn't been much progress since. Is there a way of looking at this? And you might even roll Narja into that because they participated in that and twisting it. Is there, is there a sense that they at least stop momentum and are now holding everything pretty well? And is that a good thing for them? Uh, morale in the Imperium, and this is me as like a quasi outsider, right? I have a, a character and a few characters in the Imperium just to, to kind of gauge how things are going. And it's, it's fun to meet other people. Um, but morale in the Imperium is high. They're like, ah, oh, we, we, we did it. Right. Um, two weeks ago, morale was not as high. I'm not going to say it was low, but people thought Fountain dropped way faster than it should have. Fountain was meant to like be the buffer region to delve for, I think, until like November-ish, right? Or maybe if you're like trying to plan it uh, and you're on the Imperium piece, you, you keep that Fountain uh, 
piece on the board a little bit longer than it did. And it just, it got wiped out in, in three weeks, not even. So I think that gave people a little bit of pause. Uh, now that it is slowed down, as Killer mentioned, I think they were saying, okay, we're, we're getting a little bit of something out of Fountain. We're getting some buffer here. This is good. Uh, we're happy with this. So the, the morale of the Imperium is quite quite good. They, they do feel like the... You know, it isn't. It is no longer Fortress Delve, right? And, and we said this before when we were talking to Boat. The idea isn't that you will never break down that front door. The idea is once you get in, you're going to get sucked down by all these timers, right? The narrative is changed to Delve is going to be your undoing because it is now a quagmire. Uh, you're going to get stuck in the quicksand. There's a hundred, hundred and eighty timers that you have to go through, which is like the. the the thing that they keep spouting. And it's not like, hey, we're going to defend all these timers and we're going to win. It's you're going to tire yourself out trying to take them. Uh, so even if you do take them, you're going to die here. This is very nostalgic of World War B1 and the sword fleets in Saranen. And yeah. Just we, saying. And I mean, saying obviously I'm 100% biased, but this is exactly the same narrative once, um, once the Imperium moved to Saranen one it's we don't expect to win we want to make this was it a hell war or something like that i don't even remember we're gonna bore you to death honestly 180 timers does sound worse than romina isa <laughs> <laughs> like if you if you told me i had to do 180 timers i'd leave like i'm well, just saying i think the pe thing <laughs> people are missing it. is that the defense is going to end or at least significantly diminish before even half of those keep stars are dead it's going to be like when the drf fell where the the main alliances are going to realize, okay, the space is not worth defending anymore, and then they're going to move out. And then it's just going to be a, a handful of supers grinding down structures for the people who have the patience for it. That is my prediction. That's about it. We did miss, um, we did kind of, and I completely just whiffed on this when I had it on the tip of my head, but forgot. Uh -huh. um, there was a, a significant dread fight in Catch um, that came out i think it was three days ago or so when what 60 dreads died uh total i think it was like 50 10 maybe on the numbers imperium to or imperium allies to pappy forces i, I think imperium aren't not aren't gonna want to say uh that the ferrata guys are in the imperium but they are definitely allied with the imperium and they lost a bunch of dreads oh i didn't i i didn't hear about that I mean, I heard about Dread Fight. I didn't know who was involved. I thought it was Providence uh, and Snuff or something. Uh, I think it was it was like the Stain guys that were allegedly helping out the Imperium to like bait out a fight, and then things escalated too much, and so the Imperium was like, "Hey, we're not going to take this one." Yeah. <laughs> and so those guys just died. People didn't talk about that very much. Didn't hear that. Um... Okay. All right. Uh to me, it appears that the uh, Horde does have a little bit of a problem grinding down structures, at least when they're getting defended. Just saying. Horde? But I think Horde Happy just took general, over. Because, uh, uh, they didn't it's, it's demonstrate that in like, town today, they, No, because they withdrew. It's like, come on. They, they, they tucked tail and run, right? They, they were hiding in Dell. They were commanded back to Dell. I like the way that sounds. They were commanded back to Delve. That's uh, <laughs> someone pulled on that chain a little bit too tight, and they just went all back to Delve. Like, uh, that is a fact, right? That is what happened. Did they? No, I thought was it was it was it Initiative's idea to move back into Delve, or did they get commanded back into Delve? Well, I mean, combination, if it's right? a strategically even... correct decision to make, it doesn't matter who made the decision. It matters of whether it's right for them in the long run. I... Okay, we need so to stop the spin and focus a bit more on like, does this is Carneros, this a sensible decision? The leader of Bastion says no one was commanded back to Delve. I just like the ring of it, but uh, probably not. Okay, so should we should we move on? I, we're we've been at it for two hours. We should really stop, but uh, we can't just leave it here there's a little more meta news and, and we'll try to break it down for you quickly we're not going to debate it we're just going to talk about it and analyze it like analysts of this game but uh what was the big news of the week we'll have chat take their guess and then at least what do you think the big news of the week was as far as uh, the war goes 
I mean, for me, the big the big news is the the super cap is moving to a new front, right? Uh, and I think all of that happened starting last Sunday. I think it took it took that whole week to get everyone uh, moving from fat, and so now you've got this big spooky super fleet combined with Pappy uh, that's sitting in an area that's in striking distance from a, a whole lot of new things. Good man. Uh, Artemis, what's your pick for the most, uh, the biggest news of the week? Uh, probably server and It was rather annoying trying to bash post FDC. Fortunately, it looks like that's all been taken care of. The Explorer decided to tweet out and saying, hey, it was two separate issues. We fixed them both. So that's nice. I don't think CCP fixed the internet weather issue. Good man, too. <laughs> uh, Baleful, what, was your, uh, what do you think the biggest news of the week was? I think it's been the bug with the, the gun stairs not deploying, kind of taking away some of the whole point of uh, the, at least the minor victories and fortresses outside of Mars space. Good woman. Well, I, I am very impressed by you guys. Uh, so I'll go with Caleb. Don't disappoint me, Caleb. What do you think the biggest news of uh, the week was this week? Well, hardly anything happened. The most dramatic thing that happened in this week was really the Asher post that uh, got uh, Reddit in a little bit of a uh, Nickus twist. Uh, everything exploded over there. I think Bart Ghost had it when he said that uh, it was like... Uh, placing a, a bit of a bomb in the system and it just blew up in everyone's faces and now it became laundry day and everyone was uh, getting out there with their dirty laundry and everyone was uh, emptying their closets of skeletons and trying to see what was happening in the past and uh, it became a little bit of a, a toxic shit show to be honest um, and I felt like it was what could have kick-started uh, a completely uh annulment of uh the clean fights and the gentleman stuff that we had had up till then i don't <laughs> I know. know if that's going to happen um but it it it, it could uh, devolve further but uh, i think maybe some of our talks and uh, uh maybe the 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 meta show uh going a little bit or at least attempting to go a little bit adult might have uh, defanged that i hope all right, well, that's okay. For talking in stations, a lot of people that we were talking to were talking about that. I think uh, that in the metasphere, that's what it was. So I'm really proud of you, other three that weren't paying attention to that and were. I'm going to be <laughs> honest, paying... I didn't even see this Reddit post. You didn't? I don't watch Reddit. I hate it. I love you guys. You guys are awesome. I get my news from the Intergalactic Summit. Thank you very much. <laughs> that's why you guys are here. <laughs> All right, well, if you want to know more about. Um, the Reddit post and any of that stuff. There's, uh, I'm sure it's discussed in other shows. You can also see we had a discussion on it on Thursday or Friday where uh, it kind of fell apart, really, to be frank. But uh, Caleb did his best to uh, to represent one side because the that side wasn't being represented very well. Uh, so there's a couple shows on that sort of thing. But I will say it is interesting to look at. And this is what we came away with. At least I did. Is, it's not what somebody says, it's the timing of when they say it, it's where they say it, and it, and really what they're saying and, how, and, and who the actual audience is. Because you can talk, you know, when, a, when the president of the United States or any country speaks, he's speaking, say, to a body of um, representatives, but he's really speaking beyond them to a secondary audience, which would be like the actual public. And I feel like there was a little bit of that going on with the addressing of um, narratives and good guys and bad guys and, you know, why should you guys hate us kind of. Well, just, just to take us back, right? Because Elise was there during the last one. I think Artemis uh, must have been as well. There was a similar uh, story uh, cycle, news cycle, w with something that very much resembles this, right? I, I actually was inspired to write uh, an article back then and it was pretty much on the same tone. It was this, okay, the the othering of the attackers, which is natural. It belongs in war. You always have to do that. The othering got to a point where it was kind of nasty. And then there started to come some, uh, some of those articles started to come out that had this, uh, well, 
are goons really that bad for the game and are they really that toxic and and all that stuff of course um you could say that uh, there was always still skeletons and and then you can point to different uh, scenarios and and uh individuals fine um but it was very similar um i won't say i don't think it's a defense strategy i think it's more the fact that when when other eve players in on the field start treating you inhumanely um as a non-human then going out and saying is this really fair i think that's that's pers personally that's that's natural and and i think uh, uh what we've had uh, have had during the uh, initiation of this war where everyone was trying to like speak to each other like human beings is going away and that's just to be expected i just hope that it doesn't turn into some of the very toxic stuff that actually happened during uh, World War B uh, slash Casino Wars, because that got a little bit nasty, especially because there was an unfair player on the field. So, like, with that whole point about, like, uh, the goons getting... Like, I do think, actually, the goons are treated uh, a little unfairly and stereotyped a little unfairly compared to the other no blocks. I mean, I'm mostly an outsider looking in, but like I see most of the big null blocks is more or less the same. Maybe one's a little, makes a little more money. Maybe one has a little more power, a little more uh, amount of people. But I don't think goons are any worse for the game than any other gigantic uh, group is going to be. And every gigantic group has wonderful people. There's a lot of wonderful people in goons. There's a lot of shitty people in goons but there's a lot of shitty people in pandemic hordes a lot of shitty people in brave a lot of shitty people in test a lot of and a lot of good people in all of those alliances too in order to become that big you have to take both the good and the shitty people right or else you don't get big um but i will say that one of the one of the reasons why i like rp so much and it's not the only reason but people don't tend to get out of character angry at the people they're fighting Whereas I see a lot of, a lot of uh, toxicity towards like this other group who lives over there that we're killing. Uh, they're bad people IRL, and it's like no, if you didn't have an opponent in the game, the game would be fun, right? You you need to have an opponent to make that story, to have that war, to have that good fight, to have that war that's memorable, to have all these these moments that make Eve Eve. Like if there's nobody to shoot to be on the other side, you like there's no Eve. So I, I think, um, hold on, that separation of uh, when players are playing and themselves, they're very angry because it's very personal. But if yeah. you have that extra layer of separation of RPing, you can kind of handle that anger because it's not personal. So, like, like Arcia hates the Triglavians. Like she made like a list calling out all the Triglavian supporters when the, the invasions kicked off. And like called them like enemies to humanity and like like named and shamed and like these people are evil. And but like out of character, like a lot of them are wonderful people. A lot of them are a lot of them like shit talk like me personally, but a lot of them are wonderful, fantastic people who I, I like having fights in game with and I want to have more fights in game with. And some of those fights I lose and it's still fun, right? At least I cut you off. What were you? Oh saying? yeah, no, it's fine. So uh, I, I enjoyed reading this post. It was fun. There, there is one bit. I, of course, I had to control F my name to see if there was anything in there. <laughs> see if I'm still relevant. Um, I actually did point out that I did try to poach him. Uh, of course, I tried to poach him. He's a great FC. He's a great theory crafter, uh, and I love his. Um, he used to have a podcast called the Asher Hour, oh, man. It was. Podcast. One of my favorite things uh, to go on because it was like very high level. Um, I guess the the, net, the the cultural, like thematic uh, equivalent to like the Pando uh, show uh, and Pando's uh, thing. So this was like uh, the precursor to it. Yeah. So it was very fun to do. And of course, yeah, I definitely want to take him. I, I don't think anyone offered him big cash. I think it's kind of like a. But you're a recruiter. You you pick up celebrities and. Yeah, I do. I'll take any FC that I, I think that has promise. Um, I will definitely go act actively poach, uh, or at least try to. At least that's what I did when I was much more active and when I had a lot more agency over the direction of PL. What? 
he tried to poach me. Yeah, I for sure tried to poach you, right? Ooh. So anyone that I think that can, at least when I was running PL, anyone that I thought that could do that, I'd actively try and take and, and put into my group because, you know, talented people that can run fleets and create content, that's what is the lifeblood of an alliance. It's not how much ISK you make. It's not uh, what where you are in the MER. It's how many people can you get to log in and how can these people be facilitated to. Uh, but I do want to point out one thing about uh, Asher's post. I think for the longest time, goons have self-identified as like not, maybe not the bad guys, but Eve's bad boys, right? They they got like the cool leather jacket. They've got the the greasy I, hair or whatever. I, my idea, that's like a it's a it's a different kind of role playing than what I do, but it's a form of role playing. Like they're they're gonna be like the the bad the like the I'm not gonna ruin the game. I'm gonna ruin your game, right? Yeah. So I think that's how a lot of people just it, remember. Goons. Yeah, but it still doesn't make them like bad IRL. It it like they're playing a part. They're like being they're playing the villain. They're not like puppy kickers in real life right yeah but i think also that, like when we get down to it um i don't think there are any good guys in eve like i don't think anyone no, that's, that's in the null sec the beauty of eve there are no such thing as good guys in eve yeah um, i think everyone's like kind of like in this weird gray zone this applies to player groups this applies to npc groups this applies to every faction like eve is a dark universe everything sucks and everyone is shades of gray yeah, there there was one thing that I really disagreed about uh, Asher's post, and I think it's important to touch on, um, because he said, we forced the game into taking on all players regardless of skill point. I don't think that's actually true, right? Karma Fleet came out because of uh, Brave, right? Uh, they got pork butt from Brave, and I think a lot of that has to do with, and, and I know the community gives him a lot of shit, and it's unfair to put the praise as well as all the, the shit onto him. But when Fozzy and his team iterated on frigates and rebalanced them and made them not horrible, uh, I think brave newbies were the huge winners there. And they showed the null blocks that newer players can have a huge impact on uh, in like the, the, the great outdoors or the great, However you want to call null set. And that's are really, really important and you can have a giant impact and a lot of people don't use them right. And that's not something exclusive to goons, right? To, to say that goons are the only people that took on new players. This is how test was formed, right? It was just a Reddit, a, a, just a Reddit corp uh, where new players could go out and have some fun. Goons started very similarly, right? They were just something awful guys that they were uh like our rifters cost more than your or your ammo costs more than our rifters that was the the very early goon propaganda right so i i don't think goons get to take credit for um karma fleet which they that built off of brave and pandemic cord and stuff like that that's the only thing where i'll, I'll, I'll like give them a little pushback uh, but it was very interesting to read asher's view like i i think it's cool to see that goons want to be identified as the good guys and maybe address some of the things that they saw on the back. I don't know how earnest it is. Maybe maybe you just did it to uh, mess with people and to rile them up. It certainly had that effect. Um, respect, yeah. even if that was the intention. Change the subject. Yeah. Um, that's, uh, it's, you know, I don't know if it's all that calculating. I think somebody has something to say and they write it out and then they put it out there to see how the universe accepts it. That's a big part of it. But it also does change the subject. It deals with something you have on your mind. So clearly he was thinking about these things. Uh, and that's probably the, the motivation for it. There was another person who disagreed with it. Olmeca Gold makes uh, an appearance and he writes a rebuttal of sorts, um, basically saying like, no, 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 it's all fair and game to RP. What you do, what, what, what Matani does, and the reason I bring up Matani is because even Asher brings him up as like, okay, now that I've said that goons are the good guys, let's bring up the giant elephant in the room, Matani, and how he does his rhetoric and his act. It's just an act, guys. And Olmeca, I think, uh, comes back and says, no, no, an act looks like this. This is what you guys do, and you do it all the time. You've done it recently. It's not about old reputation of goon swarm still around. This is literally some of the new stuff that you guys have done. I think he he dealt with that with a rebuttal. That was Olmeca Gold. Well, anyway, interesting. The meta um, always has a little bit extra. If Eve Online isn't enough for you. There's some stuff uh, that that players like to tug a war with uh, outside of that. 
my last my last question on this. Oh my God, hey Liz, what's up? Hello. Hey, we're on the air, but we're. Yeah, I I understand. What's uh, uh what's today? Well, we're just about finished. I was just about to wrap up. So sit right here. I'll talk to you right after the show. We'll get you on in the future. I want to go over missions, if that's all right with you. Of course. Awesome. Thanks, Atlas. Okay, hang out just for a second. Um, right. So anyway, that is uh, it. We've gone over a little bit. Um, but what do, you, what do you got going on there, uh, Artemis, behind you? Because it's backwards. Uh, so for some reason, it gets switched. Um, so that it, people are seeing it backwards. It's fixed on the screen. It is the old um, DCP. That's so bad no, for you, remembering his name. Excuse me, guard. Guard, guard, yeah. You have, to, you have to flip it so we can see it correctly. Yeah, so it has to be backwards to you. Fucking hands in the air. Let's warp to the dance floor from a band back overheating every rack. <laughs> Yeah, Such a good song. The friendship. I think it should be like it. proper for the stream now. Okay. I think Hateless was driving, so I had to move him out. <laughs> I believe the, uh, the quote is the best ship in Eve is the friendship. Although the Guard Harbinger. said it a little bit different. After the Harbinger? After Bailful. the Harbinger. You're quite disappointing, <laughs> I must say. Okay. I Can think, I ask uh, a question of Elise before we end? All right. Last question. Go ahead. Did, did you try and, and recruit Baleful before or after she won in that fight? After. Like, that was one of my first yeah, interactions. After, after, uh, Iceland after the tournament. And it's still like, uh, I know I, I don't have any weight in PL anymore, right? The, the, those days are gone. But I would still actively try to recruit and poach uh, Baleful. You did. She's here. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I did. <laughs> We recruited her TIS. You got uh, this. And she's and she's influencing me to go fight for Minmatar. So I'm I'm uh, I'm starting to think about finally throwing in with the faction. Behave on tribal lands. Just behave in tribal lands. Yeah, and that okay. includes very wild lands. Okay. All right. Uh, Artemis, thanks very much for engineering today. I uh, really appreciate you stepping in for uh, McLeod. Uh, Baleful, Caleb, uh, Elise, uh, and Fonsway, thanks for coming in and talking to us. Also, uh, Caleb, we couldn't get to him. He had to run off to a fleet. Uh, but I want to say thanks to all you guys for coming in today. And thank you, the audience. That is all we have time for today. We will see you next time on Talking In Stations.